October 62, I went over to um, New York, came over to New York from London for just personal business. NBC wanted me to move back to the States and they were discussing whether I should apply for American citizenship and it was a lot of personal contract stuff. And I checked into a hotel and went into the NBC newsroom at 30 Rock and um, just to tell them where I was and I'm going to come in the next morning. And Ed Newman, who was a friend of mine, uh, Edwin Newman, uh, he and I had seen a lot of each other in London and in Paris, where he was the, had been the bureau chief. Anyway, he said, you better stick around. Um, they said Kennedy's going to make an announcement. We think it's something about Cuba. So I stuck around, and Kennedy made the announcement of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So NBC sent me down to Washington, where I'd never been before, and said, why don't you help out? And I went to the State Department for a day, and there didn't seem to be anything to do there. And then they put me in the Pentagon for a day. And I really began to feel it was serious when I was sitting with Herb Kaplow. Herb Kaplow was an NBC correspondent covering the Pentagon with Peter Hackes. And we were in the NBC press room, uh, in the Pentagon press room, just waiting for briefings and handouts. And um, Kaplow said, we were shooting the breeze, and Kaplow said, excuse me, I just got, I've agonizing about this. I've just got to make this call. And he turned to one of the press phones and he called his wife. And he said, honey, I want you to get the station wagon and put some blankets and a mattress in the back and fill up a lot of bottles with fresh water and put the kids in and just drive west and call me every evening until I tell you to stop. And uh, now Herb Kaplan very funny guy, sane, level-headed guy. I thought, if this guy is as scared as that, then he's in as good a position as any American citizen except the inner circle of Kennedy to know what's going on. This is serious. I'd sort of come to the States with some of the European feeling from the British press and the European press that the whole thing about the missiles was a kind of cooked up thing by the Republicans to embarrass Kennedy during the um, election campaign, the congressional campaign. And um, so that happened. And then um, Sandy Van Oker, Sandra Van Oker, who was the NBC White House correspondent, told me his, form, his late wife's name was Edith. And he said, Edith and I went into our kids' room last night, and we looked at them sleeping. And we stayed there for an hour with our arms around each other. And we didn't know whether we'd all be there in the morning. Now, he was at the White House, and pretty close to the Kennedys. And that's when I thought, Jesus, this is, this is real. So then NBC said to me, they sort of woke up and said, hey, you've got a Canadian passport. Why don't you go to Cuba? So I phoned the Cubans, and they wouldn't give me a visa. So I went down to Mexico City and tried to get a visa from the Cubans there, and they wouldn't. And then um, somebody... Um, a, a woman reported there and said, why don't you just go and buy a ticket on Cabana Airlines? So I went over to Cabana Airlines and bought a ticket to Havana and, um, and got on a plane. No visa, no visa. No visa. And I got on a plane, and there were about three other people on the plane. Um, and they were, there was, they later, well, I'll describe them later, but anyway, they turned out to be foreign reporters, uh, a Luxembourger and a French woman and a, uh, and a Brit. And we arrived in Havana, and um, I presented our passports and immediately were shoved into a little room. And then they said, uh, come with us. The Havana airport was incredible. There was a huge banner up, as there was all over it. It said, en pie de guerra, you know, venceremos, um, we will overcome, on a war footing, all this stuff. Searchlights all over the airport, swarming with troops. And finally, a truck pulled up with a canvas top, an army truck. And a, an officer with a uh, machine gun said, into the back. So we all got in. And they took us down to downtown Havana. The tires sizzling on all the pavement was kind of greasy from the poorly refined petroleum that they were uh, driving as gasoline. It left, it left a kind of greasy scum on the pavement, so it sizzled as though it was raining. Anyway, we went to the Capri Hotel. The officer went to the desk of the hotel and said, these people are going to be the guests of the Cuban government. And I said, no, I'm not going to be the guest of the Cuban government. I'm an NBC correspondent, and I will pay for my own hotel room. And he said, no, you're going to be the guest of the Cuban government. So they took us up to the ninth floor, 
and they gave us each a room at the end of a corridor, and they posted two soldiers uh, outside on chairs with machine guns on their laps. And I spent nine days of the um, end of the Cuban Missile Crisis there. The day you got to uh, Havana, do you remember what stage of the crisis? Yeah, it was about two days before the ships turned around. Okay. It was peak. Okay. And American planes were coming in low overhead, and we could see from our rooms they had these sec sort of Second World War anti-aircraft guns, and they, they'd all run out and man the guns and everything. And I went to sleep the first couple of nights wondering if I was going to get bombed by American planes. Um, but gradually, it, it, we could see lots of things happening, and we could hear on the radio, on the, um, uh, the, there was a Japanese correspondent as well, and he had a Zenith transoceanic radio, and we could hear NBC from Miami saying hour by hour that I was missing, that I'd gone to Havana and I was missing. It was like... Tom, oh, you were reported as missing? Yeah, it was Tom Sawyer listening to his own funeral in a way. But anyway, we couldn't communicate. They'd shut off all our phones. And we did, it was crazy stuff. We had to get word out. So um, we knew that the AP office was uh, just along the street from the hotel. The British reporter, freelance reporter knew that. So we wrote a letter to the AP office, said we were all there, and we weighted it down with a couple of British pennies that I had in my briefcase. And we put it out through the louvers of the window and it fluttered down, the pennies fell out the letter fluttered down, ended up on top of a guard post. And then the British reporter recognized a couple of Canadian pilots whom he knew. He'd been in Havana a lot, and they were drinking at a bar across the street. And he shouted and shouted to them. Finally, they got the message. And drunken bums, they went and climbed up on top of the guard post. And of course, they got arrested. And they then found golf bags in their room full of contraband money and God knows what else. And they got sent off to jail. Anyway. So the next thing was the British reporter had had an illegitimate child with a woman in Havana. And of all things, we're, we're allowed to go from one, each other's rooms. And about three or four days later, I think the crisis has calmed down a bit by this time. And uh, we're looking out the window and he says, I know that girl. And there was a girl um, sunbathing in a bikini on a terrace about two floors below us. I mean, this is the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it was all like that. It was all kind of surreal. And he called and called to her and finally got her attention. And we took shirt cards boards from my clean shirts, cut them into quarters, and with a felt-tip pen made an alphabet, and we signaled to her, go and get the woman and her baby and bring her to visit the guy. So the next day, the woman came with the baby. And we made a message for the wire services and slipped it inside the booty of the baby. And they took it out and the guards found it. They searched the baby and they found it. What really worked to get us um, noticed, finally, because we were really sealed off, <clears throat> getting three good meals a day and we could buy Bulgarian wine from the hotel downstairs, five bucks a bottle for Bulgarian red wine, and the same arroz con pollo for every meal, but uh, still. And um, I began to do exercises to make sure that imprisonment would not make me go flaccid, you know. And I mean, Anyway, and I wrote lots of notes and things. But uh, it was the Japanese who came up with the idea of how to get out of there. He recognized that being a modern hotel of American construction, the phone lines would go up in a conduit and then would service pairs of rooms all the way up. And even though our phones were shut off at the switchboard, we could probably find another pair. So we posted the guy, Gordion Troller, for Stern magazine, uh, who spoke Spanish, out in the hall. And he just walked up and down the hall. And we went into my room, took the bed away, unscrewed the plate, and pulled out the fistful of multicolored wires that serviced all the phones. And then with a razor blade, cut into them and with the two little contacts until we found a dial tone and a pair. And then when we found the dial tone, we dialed Reuters, my news agency, which was just down the street. We told them the whole story, who we were, you know, our affiliations and everything else, put it all back, put it back on the wall, bed back to the wall, and uh, went outside in the corridor to wait, await developments. Um, with, uh, within about 10 minutes, there were two guards there. Incidentally, the guards with machine guns across their knees had little Marxist-Leninist 
books in Spanish, little red books that they read diligently. Mm. The phone operator came from downstairs and she went and spoke urgently to them. And Trawler, who understood Spanish, said, she said, somebody's been phoning from the empty room. Now, at the other end of the floor, we knew there were empty rooms because they were used for Cuban honeymooners, people who were fulfilling their norms in the eyes of the party, and they were given these nice hotel rooms to honeymoon in. But we knew that they were empty at the time. Anyway, one of the soldiers went downstairs with the hotel operator. They came back with a whole squad of soldiers and an officer. And they went and lined up in a V outside the door of a particular room down the hall. And the officer shouted, come out, whoever you are. And there was nobody in there. So then he went, and in the best Hollywood style, he threw himself shoulder first against the door. And of course, it didn't open. So then they produced a key and opened the door. And they all charged in. Of course, there was nobody there. But um, about. The next hour, when it came up, we listened to the Transoceanic Radio, and there's NBC in Miami, NBC Hourly News, saying that I was in Havana and with all these other people and that the whole story. And then people from our embassies came, and a couple of days later, a guy from the foreign ministry came, and we were released, and we could wander around Havana at will. And uh, great color. Even though the tension of the music crisis had evaporated, it was wonderful just being in Havana, go around and collect all the color we could. Couldn't broadcast, they wouldn't let us do that. Couldn't phone, but just collect stuff. And one night, late at night, um, three or four in the morning, I was in a nightclub where people from other nightclubs went when their acts were over. And there in a corner was Yevgeny Yevchichenko, the Russian poet. And uh, I had met him a year before in Helsinki during the World Communist Youth Festival. And he sat there, and in a mixture of a few words of Spanish I had, his couple of words of English, some French. We had this drunken conversation. I remember he was smoking agrarios, which are a Cuban cigarette with a tractor on it, and uh, surrounded by Cuban aficionados, bored out of his skull with them. Anyway, we had a little conversation, had a few drinks. The next day, I was the fourth day, I was having a meal with a man from the Canadian Embassy in a restaurant the same arroz con pollo, which was the food everywhere. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, there was a screech of brakes outside. A few soldiers came in with an officer, pointed guns at me, took me off to a jail where the Japanese was and one of the other um, uh, reporters. And we stayed there for three nights in a really awful little jail that had been used for immigration cases down in the bowels of the city. Anyway. There was an open space where you could come and exercise behind bars, and then in front of the bars, near the street, were the desks where the policemen sat. And they sat there in the evenings with their feet up in the desks, watching television, and television was doing a serialization, Cuban television was doing a serialization of For Whom the Bell Tolls, which was really marvelous. And little kids would come, and we could buy food from down the block. They would bring coffee cakes and things like that. It was the food in the place was awful. It was full of cockroaches and everything else. However, then they came and collected us and, and deported us, took us to the airport, gave us all our stuff back. The Cubans had gone through every note. They'd confiscated a lot of notes, but they gave me back my briefcase, and I'll remember that I have this somewhere. They had The P Cuban secret police was PIDE, P-I-D-E, and they neatly attached to everything they had translated, their little P-Day piece of note paper pinned to it with a straight pin. And in one thing, my youngest child was applying to a nursery school in London, and I had the form of application. And there, dutifully done in, into Spanish was, this is an application for a nursery school in London. <laughs> They'd gone to enormous trouble to do all this. Anyway, at the airport, they let us buy boxes of Cuban cigars. And I gave my box to Sander Van Oker at the White House, who gave it to Pierre Salinger, who gave it to Kennedy. So, Oh, that's great. That's my, my Cuban Missile Crisis.